Hello, I'm Karen Allen. Welcome to Adventures in Dolls, the United Federation of Doll Clubs YouTube channel. Today our program is the tragic yet true story of Velvalee Dickinson, Doll Lady Spy. Before we get to the program, uh, I'd like to remind you to please support our channel. Uh, give us a like, hit that thumbs up button, and subscribe. Remember, subscribing is totally free. There's no fee involved. So tune in, like, and subscribe so you don't miss your next adventure in dolls. And now, please enjoy the video. The tragic yet true story of the doll spy, Velva Lee Dickinson. The world has known about spies since there was conflict between countries. But a doll spy? Who would use dolls to betray the United States of America in a time of war? Velva Lee Malvina Blucher was born in Sacramento, California in 1893. Her parents were of German descent, but one was born in Virginia and the other was born in Kentucky. Both parents died when Velvely was a young adult. After graduating from the Sacramento High School, Velvely studied Japanese for a while in Berkeley, but eventually left that pursuit because of its difficulty. She was employed in a bank and eventually as a bookkeeper in a brokerage company owned by the man who would become her future third husband, Lee Taylor Dickinson. The company had many Japanese clients in the 1930s, and, and the couple had numerous friends and guests in their home that were Japanese. Velvely, not more than five feet tall, often dressed in authentic Japanese attire on these occasions and surrounded herself with books about Japanese culture, music, and customs. She also had Japanese jewelry and silver, as well as valuable pictures. Through those connections, she met Japanese diplomats and military officials. She was a confirmed fan of Japanese culture. The only flamboyant streak in her life was her conspicuous habit of attending social functions at the Japanese consulate in San Francisco and New York, clad in traditional Japanese attire. She had apparently found an entree into Japanese-American social circles through the many Japanese farmers in California who were customers of the brokerage business, and soon she was entertaining consulate officials in her home as well. In 1934, Velvely began to collect dolls when she was 41 years old. It started when a friend gave her a pair of native dolls from a trip to the Philippines, and then other friends began giving dolls to her, and her interest in doll collecting grew. In 1937, she and her husband borrowed $100 and moved to New York City, where Velvely worked as a clerk at Bloomingdale's. This is around the same time that Mary E. Lewis a dedicated doll collector, author, and lecturer from Brooklyn was sharing her passion for dolls to like-minded people and formed the National Doll and Toy Collectors Club, which was the precursor to the United Federation of Doll Clubs. As a matter of fact, Velvely was a member of that association for a while, but more about that later. Velvely opened her own doll shop called Velvely Dickinson Doll Shop, located at 718 Madison Avenue in October of 1941. Her business was located in a very fashionable and spacious storefront, and the Dickinsons lived nearby. Her clientele eventually numbered into the thousands and included movie and Broadway stars, 
social celebrities, as well as the regular Mr. or Mrs. John Q. Public. There is a photo of Mary Lewis, who is the founder of the National Doll and Toy Collector Club of New York City, which later became the United Federation of Doll Clubs in 1949. Mrs. Lewis is holding a pair of souvenir dolls she may have purchased from Valvoli Dickinson in her shop on Madison Avenue. Other known doll artists sold their dolls in Velvely's shop, such as Edith Flack Ackley and Emma Clear. Velvely worked hard to provide all prices of dolls for her clients. In a large ad she placed in Doll News, the official newsletter of the National Doll and Toy Collectors of New York, she advertised a 7-inch cloth doll from Palestine at $5 for a group of three, Japanese dolls at $10, Chad Valley Royal Children dolls for $10 to $15, and cloth dolls for $1. She was an aggressive and creative marketer and wrote articles for journals that specialized in antiques. It was primarily through Velvely's frequent correspondence with clients and other doll collectors that gave her doll shop the most notice. She wrote to clients, We have dolls from nearly every country in the world and state in the United States. And she traveled around the country making a name for herself as an expert in rare dolls. In the early 1940s, her opinion was sought and respected on all doll subjects, and she became somewhat of a doll celebrity. Sadly, as the doll business grew, so did the debts for Lee's constant medical problems, which grew steadily worse. Lee Dickinson was in poor health and suffered from a serious heart ailment, but continued to take care of the accounting and business transactions for the doll shop, including sales and purchase of large doll collections for resale. Sadly, Lee passed away from a heart ailment in 1943. By then, Velvely built up a decent mail order business for her dolls. But, and now comes the most intriguing and mysterious part, this tiny doll dealer who had a good business and lived in New York City during the war was accused of being a bigger spy than either Tokyo Rose or Axis Sally. In early 1939, she had joined the Doll Collectors of America with its headquarters in Fort Edward, New York. She also became a member of the Toy Collectors Club of New York, one of the units of the United Federation of Dolls Clubs. She was already on her home country's radar for participating in what seemed like some mighty fishy business. The FBI's blog entry on her specifies that the FBI's interest in Mrs. Dickinson stemmed from a letter about dolls which was intercepted by wartime censors because of its unusual contents and brought to the Bureau's attention in February 1942. The letter, purportedly from a Portland, Oregon woman to an individual in Buenos Aires, Argentina, dealt with a, quote, wonderful doll hospital, end quote, and observed that the writer had left her three old English dolls for repair. Also mentioned in the letter were fishnets and balloons. The FBI laboratory cryptographers examined the letter and eventually concluded that the three old English dolls probably were three warships and the doll hospital was a shipyard where repairs were made. They further concluded that the fishing nets referred to submarine nets protecting ports on the west coast and that the reference to balloons was intended to convey information about other defense installations on the west coast. The Portland woman's letter, it turns out, was not an isolated curiosity, as four other women reported receiving mysterious return to sender letters typewritten with what were later found to be forged signatures. 
The only thing the women had in common was their interest in dolls and the fact that they had all done business with a certain New York doll merchant, Velvalee Dickinson. The FBI matched one of the letters to Velvalee's own typewriter, and based on the postmarks, they were able to trace the other letters back to typewriters made available to hotel guests in cities up and down the West Coast, hotels that the Dickinsons had just happened to have been visiting at the time the letters were sent in early 1942. What the aspiring spy did not realize is that her Buenos Aires connection had fled after a blown cover. Hence, all those address unavailable bounce backs, which meant that her Japanese contact did not receive and disperse Velvely's doll themed coded missives. Here is an example of one of the letters. I just secured a lovely Siamese temple dancer. It had been damaged. That is tore in the middle, but is now repaired, read one. Another told of receiving an old German bisque doll dressed in a hula grass skirt. It did not take the FBI analysts very long to match up the dolls with recent United States naval ship movements into and out of repair yards on the West Coast. The doll's nationalities referred to the type of ship. For example, Siamese were aircraft car carriers. The doll with the hula skirt matched the ship recently arrived in Seattle from Hawaii. But how did Velvely learn this confidential information? She was present at many social gatherings on or near military bases due to her doll connections and she was a very good listener and needed money. But Velvely's real downfall came when the FBI started looking into her finances. Despite attracting customers from around the country, she had been struggling and borrowing money until 1942. In 1943, money in her possession was traced to Japanese officials. A subsequent search of her safety deposit box revealed $13,000 in similarly traceable bills that led directly to a high-ranking Japanese naval inspector's office in New York City. Based on the results of the FBI's investigation, bureau agents arrested Velvely Dickinson in 1944 in the bank vault where she kept her safety deposit box. She did not go quietly, however. She kicked and screamed at the burly men and resisted arrest. She was indicted by the federal grand jury in the Southern District of New York for violation of the censorship statutes, conviction of which could result in a maximum penalty of 10 years in prison and a $10,000 fine. She pleaded not guilty and was held in lieu of $25,000 bail. Mrs. Dickinson had told the arresting agents that the money in the safety deposit box had come from insurance companies, a savings account, and her doll business. Upon interview later, Mrs. Dickinson stated that the money in the box actually had come from her husband. She alleged that she found this money hidden in her husband's bed at the time of his death. Mrs. Dickinson said that her husband had not told her the source of the money, but she believed it might have come from the Japanese consul in New York City. She tried to blame her husband for being a spy. Meanwhile, information compiled as a result of the FBI's continuing investigation resulted in another indictment of Mrs. Dickinson in May of 1944, this time on charges of violating the espionage statutes, the Registration Act of 1917, and the censorship statutes. She pleaded not guilty and her bail of $25,000 was continued. In July of 1944, 
an agreement was made between the U.S. attorney and Mrs. Dickinson's attorney, whereby the Espionage and Registration Act indictments were dismissed, and Mrs. Dickinson pleaded guilty to the censorship violation and promised to furnish information in her possession concerning Japanese intelligence activities. Following her guilty plea, Mrs. Dickinson admitted to FBI agents that she had typed and prepared the five letters addressed to the individual in Argentina and that she had used correspondence received by her from her customers to forge their signatures. She claimed that the information incorporated in her letters was obtained through questioning innocent and unwitting citizens in the Seattle area around the Bremerton Navy Yard, in similar venues in San Francisco, and from her personal observation. She stated that the letters transmitted information about aircraft carriers and battleships damaged at Pearl Harbor, and that the names of the dolls appearing in the letters referred to these types of vessels. At about the same time, the doll community also removed Velvely from its membership based on her suspicious activities. In August of 1944, Velvely Dickinson appeared in court for sentencing. As the sentence was imposed, the court commented, it is hard to believe that some people do not realize that our country is engaged in a life and death struggle. Any help given to the enemy means the death of an American boy or boys who are fighting for our national security. You, as a natural born citizen, having a university education and selling out to the Japanese, were certainly engaged in espionage. I think that you have been given every consideration by the government. The indictment to which you have pleaded guilty is a serious matter. It borders close to treason. I therefore sentence you to the maximum penalty provided by the law, which is 10 years and $10,000 fine. It is noted here that she was not tried or convicted of espionage. Still maintaining her innocence and contending that her deceased husband and not she was traitor to her country, Belvely Dickinson was removed to the Federal Correctional Institution for Women in Alderson, West Virginia. She was conditionally released on April 23, 1951, to the supervision of the federal court system. Here is another mystery. What happened to Velvely's dolls and her shop while she was in jail? Perhaps she needed to pay fines and taxes and sold the dolls, or perhaps she owed so much money to lawyers and to the government that the dolls were garnished for money owed. Perhaps Velvely's brother was able to sell them. What became of her brother? He had been followed as part of the investigation in 1943, and when she was arrested, his trail stopped. She was caught, and the case disappeared. He did marry after his sister went to prison, but then the trail ends. Here is another mystery. Eunice Kennedy, who, who was not yet Shriver, was doing research for a woman's program she started at the prison and befriended Velvely. It is not known if Eunice had anything to do with Velvely's early release, but she hired Velvely as her administrative assistant and invited Velvely to her star-studded wedding to Sergeant Shriver. The family kept in touch, and Ethel Kennedy, who is Bobby Kennedy's wife, owned a doll purchased at Velvely's shop some years before. Velvely, who changed her name to Catherine, according to Barbara Casey, the author of The Doll Woman Spy, and died quietly in California in 1980 at age 87, some 30 years after her release from prison. 
Dickinson's story is strange, but the doll business could have been responsible for a lot more destruction in World War II than what had happened if Velvely's letters had been received by the Japanese. It took a long time to crack the code of Velvely's letters. The cryptanalyst who initially cracked Velvely's letters was Elizabeth Smith Friedman, the first female code cracker. She was born in 1892 in Indiana and was a teacher and a principal before becoming a government message solver long before World War II. She married William Friedman in Washington, D.C., the man who revolutionized the science of cryptology, which is a word he coined. Elizabeth's work led her to the doll woman spy, Velvely Dickinson, during Velvely's trial. When other men failed at solving the mystery of the letters, Elizabeth cracked the code and gathered information that ultimately led to Velvely's conviction. Both of these women were very famous in their time, but for entirely different reasons. But Velvely and her dolls could have been responsible for a much greater disaster during World War II if the doll lady spy had continued to use her dolls and doll connections to gather information for the Japanese. Welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the program. We'd like to thank Kathy Gregg uh, for providing us with this program. Uh, we certainly appreciate her support. If you aren't a member already of the United Federation of Doll Clubs, you need to be one. You're missing out on a lot of fun. Just click on the link at the bottom of the page It'll take you directly to our website where you could fill out the membership form and be sure to tell them Karen sent you. I'll see you next time.